Okay, clicked on, got it. Welcome back, everybody, to Beat the Big Guys. I'm your host, Sandy Rosenthal, and my guest today comes from the great state of Colorado, more specifically Fort Collins, and her name is Dr. Temple Grandin. Hello, Temple. Hi, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you. I'm really excited about talking about the important work you've done. You're most well known for your work with um, the humane treatment of animals, but you've done a lot of other things as well. And we're gonna to touch on as much as possible today. But first, since some of our guests, uh, some of our listeners um, aren't familiar with you, I'm gonna give just a short introduction, okay? Okay. Okay. Temple Grandin was born in Boston and is now residing in Fort Collins, Colorado. Temple is a professor of animal science at the College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University. She is a prominent proponent for the humane treatment of livestock for slaughter and author of more than 60 scientific papers on animal behavior. Temple is also an outspoken proponent of autism rights. And we are going, we have a lot to discuss today. And, and I hopefully first we can talk about your battle to uh, make changes in the treatment of livestock and your battle to change the status quo in that environment? Well, the first thing I can tell you, being a woman was difficult, but there was one door I saw right away. Women were in ag journalism and I was at a cattle event and there's a scene in the HBO movie about me where I walk up to the editor and I get his card because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would help my career. That's seeing a door. Another thing that helped is I worked on cattle handling. I didn't just go, oh, well, the whole industry's terrible. There's a tendency to go, oh, the whole industry's terrible. Then later on in my career, I've worked on, on um, uh, autism, uh, improving, uh, getting jobs and things for people with autism. And someone will say, oh, we got to fix the whole educational system. And I said, you fix it one school at a time, then you write about it. And I did that with cattle handling. And uh, some of my early projects are shown in the HBO movie. I wrote about those projects in both the local and the national cattle magazines. Wrote articles just explaining how to design them, why they work well. Just a lot of how-to articles. Very practical, rather than just attacking everything. Giving a solution to a problem. And and uh, I got a lot of equipment out in the field. Um, all through the 70s and 80s. And one of the mistakes I made is I thought I could fix everything with equipment. It's a common mistake a lot of people make. They go, oh, we can fix the schools with internet accessors or smart boards or some other thing like that. And I go, no, that doesn't replace teaching. Temple, that doesn't replace right. management. Excuse me. Um, keep in mind that some of our listeners aren't familiar with the work you did with the equipment, with the livestock and the cattle. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And then okay. Uh, basically, I started out and I designed a lot of improved cattle handling systems. And, and I got this equipment into the major meatpacking plants. Major meatpacking plants in the early 90s were using my stuff. And I had you know good systems out there. But there was one problem. They weren't always managed right. You have to have two things the good equipment, but you also have to have the management. A lot of uh, people tore stuff up and wrecked it. And you can't fix things just with all the technology alone. Then I had a lucky break. In 1997, I was hired by McDonald's Corporation to work with them on animal welfare. And I took their high level executives out on their first trips to slaughter plants. And when things were, went bad, they go, oh, We've got to fix some things like half dead dairy cows going into their system. You know, it's get the suits out of the office and they see what's going on. And then I developed a very, very simple scoring system for evaluating meatpacking plants where they had to make numbers. It was sort of like traffic rules for slaughterhouses. You know, traffic rules work because they're simple. And I had five very simple measures. Things like when you hang it up on the rail, it better be dead or you're going to fail the audit. You bet 95% of those cattle unconscious on the first shot. Um, if more than 1% fall in the facility, you're in trouble. And also measured vocalization because you get cattle mooing when you're handling them. You're doing something nasty to them. 
And these are what are called outcome variables. I didn't tell them how to design it. They had to achieve certain outcomes. And then I got Burger King and Wendy's doing the same thing. So in the year of 1999, I had all three of them. I trained them to all do the same thing. And it really worked. Also, since I was a designer of equipment. Can you talk a little bit more about your, the, the design, which to me was probably to you was obvious, but to most of us was not. Uh, that circular design. Yep, and this is one of my drawings yeah. right here. In fact, the way I used to sell jobs is I would show people pictures and drawings. Okay. I learned to sell my work rather than myself. Okay. And that That's what I did. And I got a lot of equipment out there, but it wasn't being managed. Because See, there's two things in the equation. You've got to have the equipment. And then you've got to have the management. And the HBO movie does a great job of showing some of the equipment that I designed. In fact, they built replicas off of the original drawings. And I was very, very happy about that. My original drawings are shown in the movie. So the tech side of me really liked that. But then you've got to have management that cares about animal welfare. And I cannot emphasize that enough. And now I'm doing, a since I'm an autistic person, doing a lot of stuff with the school systems and educators and yeah, having the fancy classroom doesn't make the school wonderful. You got to have the right teachers. I had some, I had some excellent teachers, you see, and this gets back to the, to the management. And I have a lot of books I've written where I've just written, well, how do you work with these kids? How do you handle sensory issues they might have? I'm, um, simple accommodations you can do well my latest book right now is visual thinking and in this i discuss both the design of equipment and uh, education i'm an extreme visual thinker everything i think about is a picture when i talked about my projects i'm seeing those projects and i worked with a lot of very skilled metal workers uh, back in the in the 80s and the 90s who were probably on the autism spectrum and they could invent and design anything. They were brilliant, but they couldn't do higher math. Wow. They can't do algebra. Wow. Building all the stuff, just inventing equipment in the shop. Wow. No, they're all retired now. They're not getting replaced. No, nope. I think one of the things the schools need to be doing is putting all the hands-on classes back in the schools because we need these people. You could go down in the shop and you can say, well, I need you to make something like this. And they would just do it. That'd be a shop at a meat plant. Well, they're not getting replaced. It's a real serious problem. And we need the visual thinkers. So one thing I'm getting really into right now, the age of 76, uh, is uh, helping the students who think differently to get out in great careers. Now, I'm an object visualizer. So the kinds of things I'm good at is inventing things, animal behavior, photography, art, and visual, <clears throat> visual, real high end skilled trades where you just figure out how to make things. Then you have your mathematical thinkers, chemistry, physics, your math thinkers. And the schools are pushing all the math stuff. I wouldn't even, even be able to graduate from high school today. And then you have your word thinkers. And the thing is, you need all the different kinds of minds. But I'm worried that my kind of mind is getting screened out because I absolutely cannot do algebra. It's too abstract. Uh, and we need my kind of thinkers. And clearly you've been very successful, Temple. Would it, this be an okay time to ask a question or two? And then oh, we can move sure. on? So you've mentioned some extremely important points that I think we should hammer home just a little bit okay. more. So you mentioned that um, people made these outsized, ridiculous assumptions of the things you were trying to do. And you hit on two of them today. One of them is when people said, oh, so you're trying to improve education for everybody, everywhere, which is, it, which is tip, it often happens to us, people trying to make changes for the better. And then another time they said, oh, you're trying to change the whole, the whole um, the livestock industry, the slaughter industry, and no, you weren't trying to change the whole thing. So what would be your response to when you received absurd statements like that? Which well, is the thing is what I have learned, and this gets back to different kinds of thinking, being a visual thinker, I tend to think very specific. 
And I don't care if it's about animal issues or it's about educational issues. The verbal thinker tends to overgeneralize. You know, overgeneralizing. Overgeneralize. The verbal thinker overgeneralizes. And big, broad concepts. Oh, education has gone through all kinds of crazy fads and big, broad concepts, but they haven't thought about how do we implement these things. Where I was looking at, start out designing cattle handling facilities. And so the first thing I did is I went around to all these places and I handled cattle. And I took all the good design bits that were good and kind of combined them together into new systems. But it's something specific I was working on. It was cattle handling. It was not the entire industry. It was targeted. You see, the verbal thinker tends to get way too general. Oh, everything's terrible. Well, we've got to think of some specific things we could do. And one of the things I could do when I first started was designing better cattle handling facilities that worked better. And then I made the mistake that a lot of engineering kind of thinkers make is they think they can fix everything with the equipment. That took me 10 years to learn that you also have to fix the management and the people using the equipment. And, and that's why we have you on the show to help the listeners and that learn learn from you. And Temple, you also mentioned something else extremely important. If I could, we could just talk a tiny bit more about that. Is you didn't show them yourself when you were trying to make these changes. You didn't show them you, you showed them what you're trying to do. Well, what I did, and this is one of my drawings out of one of my earlier books, Thinking in Pictures, is that I went in for an interview. I laid the drawings on the table and showed them plastic pages full of photos of completed projects. Mm -hmm. I learned to sell the work. It, and it, when it, I was in high you. school, I had a little sign painting business, mm -hmm. and I did exactly the same thing. I'd show them plastic pages with pictures of signs in them. And our listeners out there, a, a Temple has just, just said something so important that the work you're doing isn't about you. It's about the work. And if you get um, get uh, insulted or if you get any verbal harassment for the things you're trying to do, they're trying to drag you into, into the issue. And it isn't about you. It's about the work and what you're trying to do. And, well, and Temple was really, really good at keeping those things separate. Well, another thing I learned... It's better to get 80% of what you want and actually get it than go for 100% and get nothing. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I learned. And I found a lot of people have difficulty with that. It's, it's called compromise. Well, and I'm not going to only get 20% of what I want. That's not good. 80%. Enough. But that's no, still but I, if I could get 80% of what I wanted, I was real happy. Yeah, and and uh, and you and you and you go for the most important eighty percent. Uh, no, obviously, that's right. and twenty percent. It's obviously something that's not as critical and as central and crucial. I would hope. Well, let's look at something. Another issue now. We talk about an inclusive classroom for okay. people with disabilities. Do it. Um, I can I can give you specifics. Three specifics to make a classroom more inclusive for autistic students. Um. Fix the LED lights that flicker. Take your phone out, photograph it in slow motion video. And uh, because autistic kids, dyslexic kids, and ADHD kids, about 20% will have can see flickering on, on uh, LED lights, and it just almost gives them headaches. Another thing is, I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. And so give them instructions in a pilot's checklist format in bullet points of the steps. Simple accommodation. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is getting bullying under control. Yeah, those are, but you see, those are three specific things you can do. And you see people talking way generalities. We got to have accommodations. Well, let's talk about specifically what's needed. I just told you three specifics that come up all the time that are not that difficult to do. No, no, no you, none of the things you've described is is this gargantuan impossibility. They're all the things that can be done, all of them. You, and, but they work. And, yeah, and then when I worked, then then the other big thing I did on the animal handling, um, by the time the early 90s came around, I'd been in the industry from the 70s to 80s and the early 90s. I had a lot of equipment out in the big plants, lots of equipment. Center track restrainer system. You can look at a beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin. And you can see the equipment. But you know what I was really discouraged about? 
half my clients did not operate it correct correctly. They broke everything. Um, that nothing was managed. Then the thing that really made the biggest change was when I started the McDonald's audits. And very quickly, Wendy's and Burger King also started their programs all in the year of 1999. I had three burger companies inspecting the plants, all, and all the big plants. <clears throat> and I <clears throat> trained them to use a very simple outcome-based scoring system. It worked. And you can't and, uh, just say handle cattle properly. What does that mean? What's proper cattle handling? Yeah, I I, no. I wouldn't know until before before I'd seen your documentary. I wouldn't. Well, have you known. have to put numbers on it. And I had all three companies doing the same thing. Also, on um, I had we had some places with older equipment, and in most cases we could get them to get good scores with simple changes like non-slip flooring. Oh, I cannot emphasize how important non-slip flooring is. Cattle are scared of the dark. So you put a light on the chute. But you real, get people real, to real. stop using electric prod on every animal. So um, Temple, I, I'm sorry, if, if you could just share with our listeners, how did it come to pass that Burger King and McDonald's and the other big, the, the big burger companies, how did it come to pass that they visited the plants to, to well, see? And there was a lawsuit called McLibel, okay. which forced McDonald's to look at the issue. It was a lawsuit in the UK. Okay. The McDonald's was uh, you know, accused of wrecking the environment and, and doing all kinds of totally terrible things to chickens and pigs. And McDonald's actually lost part of the lawsuit. So now they were forced to look at it. And that's where I was hired to take their executives on their first trips out in the field and it was just like that show Undercover Boss. I saw those exact same kind of reactions. I'll never forget the day when they saw a skinny, emaciated, half-dead dairy cow go into their product. And they go, oh, well, we've got some things we're going to have to correct here. So that and and I imagine I, I, I am guessing that they you, you were hired because of your expertise at, by that point. That's right. That's why I was hired. Right. Because I'd already established myself as an expert on these things, on just working on things in a very practical way. So it was and a, it one was of the things we found when we started inspecting it. You take um, making cattle instantly unconscious with a stunner. You know what the number one problem is? Failure to maintain the equipment. Mm -hmm. That was the number one problem. Okay, people, you're going to have to fix your stuff. People fix their cars. They ought to be able to fix this equipment. So, well, uh, now they have documented maintenance programs. Great. So this was, a, I, I guess, an example of opportunity. Your preparation met the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, your years and years of school of teaching yourself and preparation met the opportunity, which came, which is, you know, perhaps is something we should share with our listeners. It says you you may not get your big break today or tomorrow. But I, I, it sounds to me, Temple, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a bit of a break for you. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. it was an absolute, it was an absolute total break. Okay. And, and and one of the things I was very good at doing was seeing doors to opportunity. And people often don't see that. And that goes back to walking up to the editor of the magazine when I first started and getting his card and starting to write for them. That was a very important first door to opportunity. Who have that opportunity? And I did. And okay. then I made sure I put out really, then I became livestock editor. And so I had to put out a variety of articles that my readers would be interested in. Yes, you sure did uh, mention that. There was, that was in the movie, uh, that, that woman with the um, AG journalism, um, that uh, ag journalism that you that you scoped out and went, I'm going to talk to her. So yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Go for it. Grab that opportunity when it's there. It and it might work out, and if it doesn't, so what? You know, the record will show you tried. But there's all kinds of you know doors to opportunity, and people tend to not see them. How do you? How would you? Um, that you're right. People tend not to see those opportunities. So what would be your your advice to listeners now? now well, what the other I thing is uh, when I got my opportunity, my first big jobs with all those dip vats, and. And uh, like right at the same time, like every feed yard needed to build a dip vat. And so there, there were six big, huge projects for me. Bam, like that. Now, 
I didn't have complete knowledge of all of the concrete work that has to go in that. I remember when, when the Gary Oden with McElhaney Cattle Company asked me, and I said, give me three weeks. I mean, there was no internet back then. So I knew I had to get on that phone, call up some people that I've met at the ag engineering meeting and get the engineering specs for the concrete reinforcement. You know, I didn't try to wing this, but yeah. I, and I got those drawings within a week. I maybe was at 70% knowledge, 60, 70% of the knowledge I needed. And that's why I said, give me three weeks. You see, a lot of people wouldn't have the guts to take the job. Another mistake I've seen people make is try to wing it and build the concrete without the reinforcement rod drawings. No, I'm not that stupid. No, I got engineered drawings for that for the steel rebar replacement, and I copied them. Excellent. And then the cattle handling part of it, that was all my design. But there's Excellent. concrete work where you just had to follow engineering specs, and I got drawings from the USDA. Government drawings, free for me to use. I really think I, I, I want to... Uh, um, tell our listeners that just heard some excellent advice. I can think of two times in my past where I turned something down because I didn't feel 100% ready. And one of them, I was actually offered a TED Talk, not a TEDx, a TED Talk, because I turned it down because I thought I didn't have enough time to prepare for it. I should have accepted and gotten help and been ready and been prepared. Oh, I was on the phone. I tell you, when Gary Oden came up to me, he came up to me at a, at a cattle show and I said, give me three weeks. I immediately started visiting dip vats that afternoon. Uh, somebody showed me, took me out to show me a dip vat. And the next day I was on that phone. I called up uh, Tetskis A&M University. I actually had the contacts for the USDA person in Washington uh, for the, dip, uh, the concrete work drawings. I was getting that help. I asked for help. The, another Ask big the mistake help. that people make is they try to wing it without asking for help. And no, no. I was on that phone calling up experts instantly. And the work that I had done as a reporter actually to help me to have the guts to just get on the phone and call people up. And I said, give me three weeks because those drawings had to be sent to me in the mail. This is pre-internet. But that's exactly what I said when he asked me, give me three weeks. <laughs> and people will help you because they believe in the work that you're doing. You know, you'll, now, in my case, I, I, I'm the one that got out and did the TED talk, but I could have asked for help to get me prepared on time. And how and much time did they give you to repair? Three days. Three well, that's, days. That's a bit tight. It was very tight, but I could have done it if, if I... You could have done it. You see, this is where... Hard, but now, I could have done it. They, I've seen, I've saw a terrible mess about 20 years ago. Guy came out of sales and he was... Uh, uh, going to uh, expand and modernize a big beef plant. And he was told by his engineering staff he didn't have enough wastewater treatment. Well, he had a big ego, went ahead and built it, the town shut it down. Well, you see, there's people that just try to wing it. And they don't listen to good help. No, that was a $20 million mess. And, and, uh, and Temple just brought up another point. It, you need to get good expert advice. Uh, don't oh, I, get good expert advice, uh, and 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 you can get it if you, if you're doing. No, I, I did, and I called two people, and you see, and I'd been going to the ag engineering meetings, and I had contacts for those people, but I also got very good at just getting on that phone and calling. Yep, <laughs> get on the phone the old fashioned way. It still works. You know, oh, it still works. Yeah, phones, uh, phones still work, and yes, you, you, lots it of people like we used phone. to call it the horn. But you hold that thing up to your ear. I remember get on the phone. Don't use it the old-fashioned way. Or get on the line. The line, meaning the we line. We used to call it the horn. The line. But the horn, I remember the horn. Yeah. The horn's what we used to call it. Um, but this is all spectacular advice. That, that And so, um, Temple, you mentioned there's a show on Broadway that you wanted to talk about. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. So one other big thing I'm really interested in is getting people with autism into good careers. Because as I mentioned before, a lot of the people that I worked with in these steel shops that were inventing mechanical equipment, about 20% were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. You know, and they'd gone the skilled trades route, high-end skilled trades, and uh, couldn't do algebra. 
Well, in December, I had a chance to go to the opening performance of a Broadway show. So the playbill from the opening performance that's got all autistic actors and it's on Broadway. Well, I think that's just wonderful. But you see, you had a team of people that put that together. Again, that's something targeted to do something that's real. And the other thing that's good about both about theater, AI is not going to replace theater. People are still going to want to go to live shows. It makes me happy that the Rolling Stones, at my, they're my age. They're filling stadiums still. Yeah. And live theater, live concerts aren't going away. And the need for people to just um, fix equipment and invent equipment, that's not going to go away. I'll tell you the stuff that's going to go away. The people that do all the animation for the movies, that do like like make the hair on an animal look realistic, uh, that's going to get all replaced by AI. I can see a lot of programming stuff. AI is going to just eat it up. I'm watching this really carefully. Uh, Hands-on jobs, a nurse, that's not going to go away. A veterinarian's not going to go away. You know, these are things that are uh, hands-on jobs. And I want to see people on the spectrum get into jobs that they, they're going to really like. And one of the big problems I'm seeing today is that they get the autism label and the parents overprotect them to the point that they're not learning basic things like shopping and saving money. These are things I learned in elementary school. And they're not learning work skills. I think academics are important, but uh, work skills are different, uh, a different kind of skill. You got to learn how to do a task on a schedule, be on time and do it. And and uh, the, the people and it's the, the people who are coddling, they probably think they're doing what's best, but it's not. Well, you see, what you have to be careful is is to not get into like a sensory overload situation they can't handle. Um, autistics do so much better if they get it. Let's say I got to clean the McDonald's ice cream machine instead of telling me verbally how to do it. Give me a pilot's checklist. Uh, take apart steps in bullet points like a checklist. Uh, cleaning steps, reassembly steps, because I do not remember long strings of verbal information. And let's avoid the ultra multitasking chaos jobs like the takeout window. But I worked with designers that were, you know, they were labeled drafting technician. They were laying out entire beef plants. And they just could visualize the whole thing. They were inventing equipment and patenting it. I worked with these people. They're not getting replaced. And we need the skills, and AI is not going to take this stuff away. It'll enhance it. One of the reasons why really pushing skilled trades, and I want to talk about another great program I just visited. Okay, let's TACT do it. in Denver. And TACT is teaching autistic community trades. They um, um, are teaching kids uh, how to do auto mechanics, how to do welding, how to do carpentry. Now, the way they do this, I think, is really good. They have a two-week exploration camp where young autistic adults can try out a little bit of different traits. In other words, sort of try out some stuff. Then the classes, they're small classes, six students, three cars to work on. They take the engine completely out, totally redo it. Um, one master mechanic in there and then a, um, a job coach teacher. Uh, they also teach all the soft skills, be on time hygiene you don't know, come in like don't dirty slob um uh you gotta wear your safety vest you know just all those kinds of things are taught and so it's a small class and then they put them out with car dealers are snapping them up they put a job coach with them for two or three months to just you know, cool. but they but they're being very successful and we have a shortage of mechanics right now. We have a shortage of electricians. And these jobs, let me tell you, they're not going to go away. Oh, no. AI's not going to wire your house. <laughs> Temple, who is administering the TACT program in Denver? It's a guy named Danny Coombs. Okay. And uh, the university? Nope. Nope. You know, and there's some good stuff going on in the universities. Um. Yeah. But one thing I one thing I want to emphasize 
I'm seeing two situations where an autistic kid might graduate from the university magna cum laude and not handle the workplace. We need a slow, we need to be teaching those work skills while they're still in school. Where well, they got to start learning how to do a job on a schedule outside the family. Really, really important. That needs to start at around 11 to replace the old paper routes. I, I, I was working when I was 11 years old. It was First, it was babysitting and then house yeah. cleaning for an elderly neighbor woman. Uh, and those when I was 11, 12, 13. And then when I was 16, I was a cashier at a Piggly Wiggly. But totally agreed. Work skills need work and the skills you learn need to start young. Well, and where the job coach can come in. I remember one of my very first jobs, design jobs, I criticized the welding and I said it looked like a pigeon doo doo. <laughs> and the plant engineer handled this just perfectly he pulled me into his office in private and said i had to apologize for that kind of talk he told me what i should do and that's what the job coach would do at the car dealership and let's just leave certain topics at home sex religion and politics please don't bring it to work don't bring that into the mechanic shop period amen. period period amen sports yes pets yes uh your favorite brand of beer yes that's okay I couldn't agree more, Temple. Uh, is there anything else? My producer likes to keep the podcast to um, a s set amount of time, and we've discussed a lot of important things. We've discussed a lot of different That's things, and, and whether it's cattle handling or whether it's getting jobs to people on the spectrum, I take a very, very practical approach. Also, I'm working on something that's targeted. It's not abstract. Because when I went and I visited Danny Coombs Attacked, I asked him exactly how they did it. Two week trade exploration camp where they could try a bunch of different stuff. Six uh, uh, young adults in a class with a mechanic teacher, but also a job coach teacher. Then job coaching, going into the car dealership on the job. You see, I want specifics here on exactly how they did it. Yeah. You see, and that's specifics that other people can copy. You see, it's the same approach with the cattle handle. And I would have people say, well, why do you give all your drawings away? Because it gets me more jobs. You know, people hold on to their intellectual property too much. Let it go. Let it go out there. Oh, people right now are concerned that ChatGPT is going to copy all their stuff. I go, let it. Let it. You want to go look at my stuff? You're welcome to look at it. ChatGPT. Because I want to get stuff out there. And, you know, and right now I'm spending a lot of my time just doing talks, talking about this book on visual thinking, because I'm very concerned that my kind of mind that can't do higher math, we're getting screened out. You need us. You need us and you need us really bad if you'd like your car to run. So um, specifics, targeted. Uh, are probably the main mantra. Well, that's some of the main things. And it's something specific. See, the problem with the verbal mind is it, and overgeneralizes. Like teachers come to me all the time. They say, how do I teach kids with autism? I don't even know the age they're talking about. Or, oh, we got to do low stress cattle handling. Okay, that's fine. Let's just start out with some specific things we can do. Don't scream and yell at cattle. I mean, simple things. You have to start out with little basics first. The, and moving small groups is another thing you do. It's the electric prod out of your hands. And then once you calm down, there's a lot of other things you can learn. But people need, they need some specifics. Okay, like the inclusive classroom, I'm giving you some specifics. The pilot's checklist, uh, fixing lights that flicker, and you controlling bullying. These things are great even for, for the rest of us, for the rest well, of us. Well, that's right. And, well, and, but, but especially it, this community. It, well, it, now I've learned, we, there's a, we have a concept in food safety called critical control points. I love it. Because you have to, see, I did the same thing with my measurement system for the slaughterhouses. We measure 100% has to be dead when you hang it up. Stunning efficacy at 95%, and then immediately you shoot it again. Uh, falling 1%, vocalization 3%. The animals during active handling, 
prods, you got to get 75% in with no prods. In other words, a plant had to make those numbers. Totally objective. It isn't vague, like handle cattle properly. Minimize suffering. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? So, and what this, does it mean? Where, this, okay, if you get a, if you, if your stunner's broken and you've got a 70% stunning score, you're going to fail the audit and you're going to have to fix that. But this episode is going to go a long way uh, toward that goal. Uh, if I, I understand you've written many books and there's many, many. You know, and I have some nice, I've got, I've got cattle handling books. I've got, no, textbooks. But, I've got, in fact, this is my, my textbook right here on slaughter stuff right here. Yeah, for those of you farm animals, practical way to the video out there. Temple I've got, a lot of books. I've got um, books just on cattle handling, just uh, how to handle Temple Grand's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. I've got autism books. I've come out with a young reader's edition of visual thinking, different kinds of minds. My my nephew. And both my, and both my of niece, these. My niece's son has been reading that book. So, oh, good. I hope they like that book. Yeah. So I have um, a question for the, our listeners to for this episode are likely people who are trying to buck an establishment and change the status quo, much like what you went through when you were trying to change the way this, the slaughterhouses were designed. So for that niche group of people, what, what book? Well, book first of all, so let's not say the that? status quo. That's too vague. Okay. That, I yeah. started out with slaughterhouses on improving the handling facilities. Okay. That again, that's something specific. Right. And but I would wrote, write in the meat, meat trade magazines uh, diagrams and pictures of, of system. Like I'd get a new system in, I'd write about it in the trade magazines. Writing was very important in my career, but I didn't write the, the, the status quo is terrible. I wrote about, well, this is how you design this handling system. We put it in change. such and such plant. There were some people that didn't want it to change. And, and, and you had to get through to them. And you, and oh, you I, oh, I used workman's comp. Mm -hmm. I were, used a labor, I could take out an employee, bruises, reduce bruising. Oh, I was really good on all the economic stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you see, but, but the thing I worked on was specific. Right. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I've been hearing a lot of stuff about certain communities have a you know, horrible air quality, like a coal dust or something like that. Right. Well, my approach to that would be, let's teach the community how to get out and measure that with simple methods, and then you publish it on one day. And be specific. That would be my approach. Again, specific. And, and specific. Don't overgeneralize. It's meaningless. It pretty much is meaningless. Uh, okay, you did something with water stuff, I guess it was. You did? Yes, yes. I, I wanted to get the word out to the world that the flooding of New Orleans was not due to any mistakes local people did. It was the federal government had misdesigned the, its levees. And but that's specific. Yes, very. That is very. specific. I also have in my visual thinking book and in the different kinds of minds, um, visual thinking mistakes with things like the Fukushima nuclear power plant. It needed waterproof doors, which it did not have wow. to protect the electric emergency cooling pump. You see, that's a visual thinking mistake. The yes. mathematicians calculate risk. Visual thinkers see it. Electric pumps don't run underwater. And this is an electric pump no. you need really badly. No. Uh, this, has, this has been so incredibly informative. It is jam-packed with important information. Uh, Temple, thank you so much for joining me for today, for setting aside some of your very valuable time to talk to me. No, I really liked doing this, and it was absolutely great talking to you. So the kind of bottom line in my yeah. work, whether it was uh, humane treatment of livestock or it was, you know, getting jobs for people with autism, is working on things that are specific. Like, okay, when I visited TACT, I had to ask him, what exactly do you do? Because he had a tendency, he has a book out right now that's way too vague, um, to make this auto mechanics program work. I want specifics. I want simple stuff that people can follow. And then on cattle handling, another big thing we have to do is moving small groups of cattle, not overloading the facilities. That's something constant. You bring up seven pigs, not 20. 
you bring up 15 cattle, not 30. The, this is something simple, and it's very some with the facility. But management has to enforce that because that good handling takes more walking to walk back to the yards and bring up those small groups. But that's one of the things you've got to do to have decent handling and stop yelling and screaming and banging the shoot with a you know driving aid. And, and, and the other thing is you have to have a, a scoring and evaluation has to be simple. So I developed that very simple scoring system. They had five numbers they had to make. And I had McDonald's enforce that, Wendy's enforce that, and Burger King enforce it. All the same, worked beyond my wildest dreams. And the other thing I did, I designed equipment. So I bent over backwards not to shove equipment down their throat that they did not actually need. We did a lot of repairs, a lot of maintenance. And even in some of the older, shabbier facilities, we got them to work. It's amazing what some non-slip flooring does. What moving small groups does, fixing your stunner does. A whole lot of little things adding up to big things. But it was really targeted and specific. It wasn't going, oh, the whole industry terrible. See, there's a tendency, too much verbal top down. This was a lot more bottom up. Fabulous words of wisdom that I, I hope that our listeners are going to put those words of wisdom to work and make the world a better place in their own communities. And pick out something targeted you can work on. Right. And, and okay, this discover, you know, like the thing I was talking about, you know, the, the, the bad air quality or bad water quality. Teach the local people how to measure it. Mm -hmm. Some of the measurements are quite easy to do. Numbers talk. Numbers talk. You see, and that's what I did with my animal welfare scoring. It was all, it was numbers. Yes. So thank you again. Okay. Tim. And um, stay with me for just a moment. Thank you, the listeners. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, Temple, stay with me for just 30 more seconds. I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>